Hello everyone, welcome back to our second lecture video on meiosis. In this video, we're going to discuss meiosis II, the second division stage in which we're trying to get to the point where we produce both sperm and or egg cells. So last where we left off, we had produced two cells right here where my laser pointer is. Uh, two, these two cells here are going to be haploid. All right, the original cell we had started with had a total of six chromosomes. All right, so you can see here in prophase one that we had one, two, three homologous pairs or tetrads that had undergone synapsis and crossing over. And by the time we get to telophase one and eventually cytokinesis, we have two cells that now have three single chromosomes in them as opposed to six. However, they still exist in the sister chromatid pair form. So we need to go through a second division stage in order to split those sister chromatid pairs. So meiosis two is going to be very similar again to both mitosis and meiosis one. All right, we're going to have PMAT happening once again, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, but we're going to put a two designation after each phase. All right, there is a short interphase period that happens between meiosis one and meiosis two. So the two cells produced in meiosis one will kind of just take a break, undergo interphase. However, there will be no DNA replication occurring like there was in the first interphase. So each haploid daughter cell that was now produced in meiosis one is going to undergo meiosis two. So we're going to see two cells going through meiosis two at the same time. All right, and as far as how the steps look and how the chromosomes move, Meiosis II is going to look almost identical, if not identical, to how the chromosomes move, line up, and separate during mitosis. And you'll see that here in a moment. So I'm not going to go over the nitty-gritty details that happen in each phase because it's going to be very similar to what happens in mitosis. So more so, we really just have to look at the diagram here and follow the flow. So we're right here, ending meiosis one. The two cells now eventually are going to enter meiosis two. So here we are in prophase two. Everything that normally happens in mitosis will happen here. Nucleus starts to break down in each cell. Centrioles start to move to the poles. And eventually the spindle fibers will connect to the kinetochores on each side of the chromosome. And remember, the kinetochores are attached to the centromeres, which are the little black dots that you see in the middle of each chromosome. In metaphase two, now we have individual sister chromatid pairs or individual chromosomes lining up along the middle of the cell. Again, top to bottom, left to right, doesn't matter. However, it is in the diagram. But no more tetrads or homologous pairs. They were separated way back in anaphase one. Mm -hmm. All right, now we just have the individual chromosomes lining up. Three chromosomes in each cell. Now we get the anaphase two. It's the sister chromatid pairs or the chromosomes that do split during this stage. So we do have a temporary doubling of chromosomes here again. We would have went from three in each cell to now once the centromeres split, we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six chromosomes in each of these two cells. And we hopefully will get to the point where telophase two and cytokinesis starts to happen where now I'm having one, two, three, four cells being produced. They haven't fully separated yet, but cytokinesis, you can see the cleavage furrow starting to happen in each of these cells. But more importantly, if I look at the chromosomes in each of these cells, I now have just one, two, three single chromosomes, as opposed to the three sister chromatid pairs that we began meiosis two with, and don't forget, way back, the original diploid cell that started this whole process had a total of six chromosomes. But again, now we have just three single ones. And if you take note, every cell, the chromosomes look completely different compared to any other cell. And once more, that was due to crossing over that happened during prophase number one in meiosis number one. So again, meiosis is going to give us four completely unique haploid cells. Overall, the outcome of meiosis two, again, the two cells that we just seen for meiosis one, mm -hmm. and at least in regards to human cells, each of the two cells of meiosis one started off with 23 chromosomes or sister chromatid pairs, so we would have seen X's. 
And now after meiosis 2 is complete, we're going to have four cells that are haploid, but they would now have 23 single chromosomes. So I just have like a single line right here in the bracket. Again, every single one of the four cells will be unique due to the crossing over that happened in prophase 1. Again, do not forget, crossing over, which introduces variation, happens in prophase 1, not prophase 2 or prophase of mitosis. You have to say prophase 1 to indicate meiosis 1. Males, again, are producing sperm, while females are producing haploid egg cells, or the fancy word for an egg cell actually is an ovum, O-V-U-M. To look again once more at this diagram that we started off with in the first animation for meiosis, here's a diploid cell starting with four chromosomes. If that cell were to go through mitosis, sister chromatid pairs are nowhere near each other. They line up as individuals, again, four chromosomes. And then after anaphase and telophase i have two cells that each have four chromosomes and they are 100 percent identical to the original starting cell but if that cell commits to meiosis you can already see tetrads or homologous pairs forming in prophase one does not happen in prophase of mitosis crossing over occurs metaphase one i would still have four chromosomes but now they're lined up as tetrads or homologous pairs it's the tetrads or homologous pairs that split during anaphase 1. And after telophase 1 also, I have two cells, again, you can see already are haploid. There's only two chromosomes in each of these cells as compared to, compared to four that we began with. But since they are still in the sister chromatid pair forms, the Xs, each cell has to go through, again, a second division, meiosis 2. And I'll get four cells that now have single chromosomes so each one has two chromosomes that are single copies as opposed to two chromosomes in each of these two cells from meiosis one but that still have identical copies attached by the centromere quick overall um, compare and contrast in mitosis there is one division stage so pmat in the meiosis we're going to have two division stages so we have pmat one and pmat two we're producing two identical diploid somatic cells. In meiosis, we're producing four completely different haploid cells. And again, mitosis only produces identical somatic cells, which are also called body cells. And in meiosis, we're producing gametes, which again are sperm and egg cells. Now, as far as meiosis goes in men versus women, the overall process is very similar. However, the overall outcome is going to be slightly different in males versus females. So I just want to quickly go over that. Meiosis in males is referred also to as spermatogenesis, and meiosis in females is referred to as oogenesis. Genesis is creation. In males, spermato means sperm. O means ovum, or what the egg cell is going to be. So in spermatogenesis for males, all right, this is going to occur in the testes of a male, but it doesn't start until they reach puberty, whatever age for them that happens to be. Let's say anywhere between 11 and 14 is where it's going to begin for the average male. In a male's testicles, there are somatic diploid cells. All right, that means they would have 46 total chromosomes. And they're called spermatogonium. So I want you to remember that term there. So here would be the spermatogonium that has 46 chromosomes. All right, that spermatogonium can go through mitosis to replenish its numbers, or it can fully commit to meiosis to make sperm, like you see over here. Spermatogonium have to undergo mitosis. Otherwise, if they just did meiosis, Guys, you would have ran out of sperm already at this point in your life, and you would no longer be able to conceive ever again. So we always got to make sure there's a constant supply of spermatogonium. So for us guys, one spermatogonium will give rise to four fully, hopefully, functional haploid sperm. I say hopefully because mistakes do happen. But we do go from one diploid somatic cell, spermatogonium, 
to four fully mature haploid gametes or sperm. Now, ladies, for you, it's going to be relatively similar. So the picture down here is almost going to be the same for you, but just with a couple minute differences. So for you, ladies, for oogenesis, this also is going to happen um, once you reach puberty, and it's going to occur in the ovaries. The only difference is, ladies, you are born with all the ogonium that you would ever have. All right, it says roughly one million, but it could be anywhere, honestly, from 100,000 to a million. But since you're going to only be releasing one egg cell per month, ideally, sometimes it might be two or three, but it should only be one, that's going to be enough for you during your childbearing years until you would reach menopause in your late 40s to early 60s. Depends. It's a little bit different for every woman. Now, again, the key difference here is, ladies, for you, you're only going to release one mature egg cell, or again, ovum is the fancier term for it, per month. Now, you do make four cells. So, for example, if you look down here at this diagram on the bottom right, it looks just like the one for spermatogenesis. So, ladies, here is your ogonium that's in your ovaries. It would have 46 chromosomes. It's diploid. Once a month, it will go through meiosis. You will make over here, if you look where my laser pointer is, four cells. However, of those four cells, only one of them is going to be a large mature egg or ovum cell that you can use to become fertilized by a male's sperm. The other three cells that are produced are not mature egg cells. They're much smaller, and they're referred to as polar bodies. Now, the reason why they're much smaller is if you take a look, after the first meiosis here, I have two cells, but one is bigger than the other. And then after these two cells undergo meiosis two, the smaller one here undergoes meiosis and gets two smaller cells. The one that was larger after meiosis one goes through meiosis two, and it splits unequally again to produce a larger egg or ovum cell and one more smaller polar body. Now, the reason why they have split unequally now what was been being split unequally actually is the cytoplasm the liquid inside the cell all right again the cytoplasm inside this original egg cell here is going to provide all the nutrients sugars and proteins that the developing zygote slash embryo is going to need until it can be fed by the placenta and the umbilical cord but until then this egg cell that becomes fertilized, so over here, here's an ovum getting fertilized by a sperm cell, it's on its own until eventually it gets to the uterus, burrows into the uterine wall, and eventually then a placenta and umbilical cord start to form. So if all four of these cells were the same size and they'd be tiny, all these cells would run out and they could all get fertilized and they would all starve to death before they would make it to the uterus and a placenta and and bulk cord would form for each one of them to feed them. So it's a good thing that this is happening. So one more time, ladies, you do make four cells, but only one mature or usable egg cell slash ovum. The other three much smaller cells are called polar bodies. They're smaller because the cytoplasm was divided unequally during both meiosis one and meiosis two. And they'll just be reabsorbed by the body. They'll degenerate and your body will reabsorb them and reuse any of the nutrients that they can. But again, both spermatogenesis and oogenesis are simply meiosis. It's just how they go about occurring in males versus females. If you have any questions, make sure you ask me in class. Thank you very much.